Today is Easter, which is not a news anymore. We are all aware of that. And uh, it's so important for us as Christians to celebrate Easter year after year. And year after year, even, if, even as we celebrate, the meaning of Easter come alive to us every time we talk about this. Every time we talk about this, the meaning of, of the Easter, the meaning of the Easter, it never runs old, never grows old. It comes alive in a fresh revelation again and again. As I was preparing this message, uh, it really touched my heart again, though this is nothing new. This morning also as we were singing the song, the Spirit of the Lord was reminding me how my life was before I met Christ and how God changed my life completely and, and I live a life that is full of hope in Christ. And what a joy. And that's because of the Easter. That's because of that Jesus was resurrected and gave me such hope. So the, the, I have entitled this message as the good news of Easter. The good news of Easter. Because it is such a good news. Such a good news for every one of us. And I'm going to proclaim the good news to all of us this morning. Why do we celebrate Easter? Simple. Jesus Christ is no more in the tomb. The tomb is empty and he has conquered sin and death for us. How these, all these stories, different stories in the universe put together for this grand big story of God. And that's the story leading to Easter Sunday. So in every story, we need to understand the big picture of the story. Yesterday, or day before yesterday, on Good Friday, Ashok did a wonderful job. He painted a full picture of how the gospel came together. And I'm going to do similar things like that because unless we understand the big picture, uh, we can't appreciate why Easter is so important for us, why the gospel or the good news is so important for us. So always go back. Go back to the, to the beginning. Go back to the beginning. So God created mankind. Some people say, no, 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 God didn't create mankind. It was a big bang that happened and something went and then we came into being. No, 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 I don't believe that. God said in the Bible, the first sentence of the Bible, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that is the word of God, which I believe with all my heart. And that has proven again and again. So I believe that God created man. And God said in Genesis chapter uh, uh, 1 verse 26, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. In our likeness. So you are not ordinary because God has made you in his likeness. You have the characteristics of God. You have all the characteristics of God. We just need to manifest that in our lives, in our lives. And that's God's intention and God's, God's hope and prayer that we all will manifest the beauty of God in our lives. And that is his, his intention right from the beginning. So we are not a descendant of monkeys, okay? Please, God created Adam not as a baby but as a mature man. And it's not monkey or small baby or some evolving happened. No, no, that's all man's theory. And it can't last and it can't prove also. But what the Bible says, it stands true all the time. So I believe with all my heart that I am not from the descendants of monkey. God created us to worship him. God created us in his image so that we can worship him with all our being. I, I like the, the uh, Westminster's Catechism that summarizes, summarizes this teaching about how and why we are made. It says the first question, what is the chief end of man? What is the purpose of man? They said, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's your life ambition. That's my life ambition. I just want to enjoy God forever in my life. I just want to worship God forever in my life. That's my end goal. That's my chief end. And this morning, we need to do that. We need to do that. We need to learn to worship God. This morning, I was just reminded of how I need to minister 
to God. I'm a simple, tiny, little man. The existence is so, uh, so minimum. But then I, even in spite of my weaknesses, I can worship the living God. I can minister to God. What a privilege. What a privilege. And I need to do this often. And in my life, this is one of my goals. I should do that. The Garden of Eden, where God created man and, uh, uh, man and woman, Adam and Eve, was a perfect, perfect place. They have a perfect relationship with their father in heaven. They have a perfect relationship with husband and wife. Everything was perfect in that place. Uh, there is this uh, uh, an article written, uh, uh, an article called How It All Began and How It Will Never End. How it all began and how it, it will never end. They said like this about the Garden of Eden. He says, by God's design, all of creation was in harmony and was exactly the way it was supposed to be. During this time, there was no pain, suffering, sickness, or death. There was complete love, acceptance, and intimacy between God and man, between Adam and Eve, and throughout creation. Adam was not afraid of the tiger that the tiger would eat him up. There was no, there was a perfect relationship among the creations, among the creations of God. And that is what God wants us to restore, restore and redeem in our lives as, as Christians. And when God created this heavens and the earth, and including man, he was so pleased. He was so pleased. God saw everything he had made and behold, it was very good. The Bible says it was very good. God was so pleased with, with all his creation. But there was one exception. And he said, he, 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 he gave a command to both Adam and Eve. You can eat from the fruit of any tree in this Eden garden. There are thousands and millions of trees here. Wonderful fruits and vegetables. You can eat from any except the one in the middle of the, middle of the garden, which is the tree of the knowledge of evil and uh, good and evil. You should not eat that. Only one small exception out of millions of fruits. He said, just this one. And people are asking this question and again and again, if God is good God, why is he putting evil in that place? Why is evil here in our society? God does not make robots. God made human beings in his image who can think and who can take decision and God gives them freedom of choice. Freedom of choice. And he gave only one exception in that. And you know, when, when, when the doctor says, do not eat anything to do with sugar. We love sugar. Now suddenly we love sugar. Earlier we don't like sugar, but now suddenly because doctor says, we like sugar. Yeah? Things that our parents said, don't do it. We want to do that only. In my growing age, uh, growing this very young age, me and my elder brother, we, we kill one chicken. Quietly in the daytime when my parents were away in the battlefield, we kill one chicken and we, we ate that. And my brother warned me sternly, we finish everything, we will wash the dish, wipe our mouth, <laughs> all right? Wipe it clean. Don't tell anybody, don't tell my parents. So I said, yes. With all seriousness, I said, yes. The moment my parents came, I ran to them and I told them with all the seriousness, we did not steal your chicken. <laughs> so my parents know what has happened. What our parents doesn't want us to do, we want to do that only, right? Things that God pro prohibits, they want to do that only. They want to concentrate on that particular tree, which is prohibited. And lo and behold, Satan is, is such a crafty, uh, crafty evil. He came one day and he, he asked if, and uh, he asked him, did really God told you not to eat any fruit? And Eve said, no, no, no. God said you can eat all any fruit except one in the middle. Uh, otherwise, we will die. We will die. But, but uh, this, this devil said this one. So that's how, that's now we are entering into how the sin enters into this world, into this world, okay? So sin entered. So that's the time that, that when Satan tempted tempt her, uh, and, and this is what the Satan says in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. He says, you will not certainly die. The servant said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it with your eyes, 
from when you eat from it your eyes will be open and you will be like god knowing good and evil now satan is offering freedom to eve and every one of us likes freedom nobody wants to be under somebody we want to be free forever whatever means it is and that freedom is not a good freedom that that they were looking at they were they were uh, adam and eve they want to free from god's commandment they want to free from god's covering and that's that's in other words is called rebellion they are now rebelling against god and say now we need, we need freedom who are you god now we can do with our own now we can exist with our own so there is a sense of rebellion in them and and, and eve was thinking like this when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food good for food yes all the trees were good for food not only this and pleasing to the eye i don't know what kind of fruit was it's not an apple as people think and also desirable for gaining wisdom now the uh, satan has said no you'll have good and evil you'll know good and evil so desiring and it, it will help her to gain wisdom she took some and ate it she also gave some to her husband who was with her no comments <laughs> and he ate it no questions asked he also ate it poor fellow <laughs> ever since nobody blames eve it becomes adam's sin <laughs> adam's sin <laughs> oh <laughs> so adam took over that sin and god indeed he came and 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 reprimand both of them and and punish satan punish uh, eve and punish uh Uh, Adam also and God chased them out of the Eden garden so the Lord God banished them or banished him that is Adam and Eve from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken so they have lost their paradise at that point of time they were having that perfect relationship with God but that is broken there's a big gap between me and God and that has been passed on to us and that is why we we don't teach our children how to steal 10 steps to be skillfully stealing things we don't teach them that they know it by heart but they know it they just grow up like that okay we don't have to teach them how to tell lies technically this one this one we don't have to tell them it just it's just in them it's just in them just in us that's our natural tendency we want to tell lies little bit white lies that's natural to us and that is from our great great grandfather adam and eve thanks to them yeah and the bible says this in isaiah chapter 53 verse 3 we uh, all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way we have gone astray from god we have left paradise and in eden garden the perfect will of god and astray from god and that's why we have become sinful and so sometimes when you preach the gospel some some people say but i am not sinful i don't think any i i can't remember made it sin here but i'm saying you have sin right from the beginning right from your mother's womb you are born as a sinful man or a woman so we have that but the story the grand big story does not end there if it ends there it will be so sad the old testament in the old testament people were trying to now uh, uh trying to pay the price for the sin by sacrificing animals whenever they sin but how long can you sacrifice animals and uh, it, it, it's it does not bring any permanent solution so god has a good news and a great grand plan for us and that is the good news of easter that's the good news of easter and before we look at the good news of easter we must understand what happened on good friday and ashok has already explained to us on good friday how jesus had to go through that that gruesome death the 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 
the, the method of death, which is the most gruesome death that human being can ever imagine, ever invented, was, was meted upon Jesus Christ. And he died that gruesome death because he loved us so much. And he was under the grave. Yesterday, like Saturday, he was under the grave. And, and, and some of these, uh, our uh, forefathers, the great theologians, they have said, Jesus went to hell. It was so bad. It was so bad. He, the father turned him away because of our sin. And Jesus cried out on the cross, why have you forsaken me, father? And that was much, much more painful than the actual pain that he, he bore on his body. And so it is not easy. Yes, it is free. The gift of salvation is free, but it costs Jesus his life. It costs Jesus his relationship with his father. And it is painful. But as I said, the story does not end there. On Easter day, today, Jesus rose from the dead. Hallelujah. Yes, because he rose from the dead. Now he conquered the sin of all our sins. And he conquered over death. That means we will also rise from the dead and live with Jesus for eternity. And our hope is, is not only here in, on the earth, but it is way beyond this. It is for eternity. And we look forward to that day. And that is why Christians, we never, we're not afraid of death at all. We, we consider death as a promotion, a homecoming, a homecoming. That is such a such a radical thinking for, for other, other people because death is so scary for them. But for us, it is a promotion. And what a shift in our thinking. What a shift in our perspective of life. Apostle Paul in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 4, he says this. He summarized this gospel in this way. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Sometimes we, we say that, oh, the, the theology is so difficult, oh, the, the, the gospel is so difficult, but Somebody has put it this, I think it's Augustine or Jerome, I can't remember. He, they said this, the message of the gospel is shallow enough for a child to wade in and yet deep enough to, draw, to, to, to drown an elephant. Yes, it is, it is a sh in, in a way very simple so that children can understand the gospel and that's why children embrace Jesus Christ in their young age. And I don't doubt about that. My children embrace Jesus Christ in their young age, maybe at the age of seven years. They embrace Jesus Christ. And we can see the change in their lives. Children can understand that. And adults can understand that. And there is so much of depth in it. The gospel of Jesus Christ, nobody can say that I've understood everything. It is so deep that you can't say that I've understood everything. It is a lifelong learning. It's a lifelong learning. So let's define good news. Let's define good news. I, I, I like this Thomas Scott and Tom Wood's definition of, of good news. And let me read this. It says, Jesus Christ, God the Son, joyfully obeyed God the Father, who sent him to rescue his rebellious creation, creation that is you and I. Jesus was miraculously born of a virgin. He was sinless. God became a man. He willingly paid the price for our rebellion, spiritual, eternal, and, and physical death by dying on a cross. Then he was raised back to life to demonstrate his complete victory over sin and death. Jesus came to establish his kingdom rule and to redeem, that means buy back for himself at a price, a people of his own possession a people of his own possession jesus looks at you jesus looks at me and he said you are my prized possessions you know Atu and i we have two children they are our most precious 
possessions. We hardly have any gold anyway. We don't have much possessions anyway, but whatever it is, even if we become millionaires and whatever, we will still say our children are our prized possessions. And God is looking at you. God is looking at me and say, you are my prized possessions. You are the apple of my eye. I love you. I love you. And that is possible. That is possible only because of the death of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. As C.S. Lewis says, says this in his, in his book, God in the Dark, he says this, the perfectly innocent died to rescue the hopelessly guilty. We were hopeless and guilty. He took the place on the cross rightfully meant for us to pay for sins we've committed and will commit against God, against God. And for those of us who have received Christ in our hearts, we remember how our lives were completely turned around, completely turned around. I was going towards another direction altogether, completely away from God, even though born in a Christian family, completely away from God. I have no interest in, in this kind of gatherings. My heart was completely rebellious and turning away from God. But God met me in his grace and made me understand that simple gospel. And I received Christ and allowed Christ to come into my heart and become my savior. And what a turnaround. He turned around my life. And now my perspective has changed. My value system has changed. My life has changed. That is the power of the gospel. That's the power of the gospel. I want to share with you another definition from Steve Childers, Associate Professor of Practical Theology at Reformed Theological Seminary. He says about this good news. He says, the good news of the kingdom is that our king has won a marvelous victory for us. Through his sinless life, sacrificial death as our substitute, resurrection and ascension, he has not only conquered death for us, removing his penalty, but he has also conquered sin's power over us. Now, through repentance and faith, God means for us to tap into the powerful victory in our king so that we might be transformed into true worshipers of God and more authentic lovers of people. Through faith, we are always to be placing our affections on Christ. What a definition. It captures really my heart. And there is so much of power in this gospel. As I present this gospel to you, I believe that the Lord is working in our hearts. Because the Bible has clearly said the power, the gospel has the power to change lives. It is in Romans chapter 1 verses 15 and 16. It says, that is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Hallelujah. When we hear the gospel, when we understand the gospel, and when we respond to the gospel, there is power in it. The power of the gospel will change our lives. That's changed my life. That's changed the lives of so many people here. So many people over there in the Zoom. God has changed us. And so what is our response then? What should we respond? And how should we respond? What should be our response? Number one is realize that you are separated from God by sin. This is, this is a revision for people who have done your foundation course recently. This is from your chapter, Salvation. And it says this, that you realize that you are separated from God by sin. And the next thing is recognize that God loves you and has answered to save you. You might be thinking my situation is really bad. I'm really trapped in this sin. I'm in a bondage. But I tell you, God has an answer for that bondage. God has an answer and has a power to free you and, and free you from that bondage. And number three is the conviction of our sins. We need to understand that we are sinful. We have rebelled against God and we need Savior. We need a Savior. And that is only in Jesus Christ. And the fourth point is that there, there we should have intense desire that the sin or the sinful life be undone. 
I'm fed up of this sin, sinful life that I'm living, and I want to get out of this pit. And God will come to your rescue. Number five is confession of sin. We need to confess with our mouth. We need to confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is our Lord, and he will save us. When we believe that, God will save us. God will save us. But those who conceal their sins, as the proverb says in 28, 13, he who conceals his sins does not prosper spiritually. But whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Finds mercy. And then we repent of our sins and change our mind. Ask the Lord to forgive you and receive Christ in your heart and say, Lord, now you will be my master. You will be my, my manager. You manage my life. I've been managing all this time and I've failed it completely. Now, Lord, you manage my life. That is the kind of confession that you make and repent of your sins. And the last one is that we receive God's forgiveness by faith. It is by faith that we receive God's forgiveness. When you, when you trust God, when you trust that Jesus really died for my sin, and when I confess my sin, he can give me a new life. If you believe that, it is only by faith. You can believe God and receive God by faith in your heart, and there will be change and transformation in your lives. The Bible is very clear about how Jesus saved us through his resurrection. In John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? That's the question God is asking us today. And the second verse that I want to read is from 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has so much of power. And what is the result? What is all this about? What will happen? At least two things will happen. You will have a new life. You will have a new life. And you will have a new relationship. New relationship with God. Your relationship with God will be restored. Your relationship with human beings also will be restored. There is power. The new power, the spirit of the Lord will live within you. And things that you feel that you are not able to overcome, you will be able to overcome. Things that you feel that you are already in the bondage, those bondages will be broken in the name of Jesus. The spirit of the Lord will enable you to live a victorious life.